and welcome. And today we'll be um, doing a, a, a presentation on what we call well-formed goals. So an introduction to one of these methodologies that we have um, in our work at Transcend International. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, um, we are a global organization that um, is oriented towards helping individuals and other organizations be, to be adaptive and optimize in the face of increasing pressure, uh, stress and overwhelm, and really constant uh, change. Uh, very relevant to the world that we live in today, wherever you are. Um, and this is really the mission behind our work. So um, if you can just advance the slides, Tony. Um, uh, this, this kind of work that we do or, or this mission reflects in um, various ways that we conduct our work. One is through our coach trainings. For, so I see some people here who actually have done our professional coach trainings and got certified by us and um, uh, were supported in their accreditation process. And um, some of you guys, the material that we'll be explaining today might be familiar. <laughs> um, we also um, um, manifest this mission in our professional coaching services. So we do coach as well, um, either to individuals or groups and, and teams and organizations. And also what you'll see today is um, a part of the kind of vast material that um, we use in our um, coaching skills trainings and just leadership development trainings in organizations as well. So these three tracks that um, we, we work in. Yes, so uh, Tony, if you can just advance the slide. So um, with us today is uh, Tony Dickel, who's the CEO of Transcend International. Um, again, some of you guys might be familiar with him and he'll, he'll enter the um, presentation soon. And you can see here Tony's credentials. So um, with uh, decades of experience in the corporate and, and leadership level, um, he brings that into um, his executive and professional coaching practice um, as a practitioner, but also as a trainer for coaches. Um, something that uh, Tony brings and also our organization Transcend brings into our work is um, uh, mindfulness as well, which is one of our uh, unique perspectives in our professional coach training. Um, Tony is also um, a psychotherapist as well um, in, in, in practice. Um, so Tony, you can add anything about yourself as well <laughs> in addition to that. Um, but if, if not, we can proceed with today's workshop. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Um, I, I'm, I'm really, really glad to see so many, so many people um, on, on this uh, rather short uh, webinar. Uh, dealing with the very, very important topic of, of goals um, and how to, you know, uh, and the way that we're going to step into this is we're going to first look at it, uh, why, uh, why do we need to be careful about how we set goals, you know, um, and in order to step into that, we're going to be looking at just a little bit of why is it that we do what we do and why do we not do what we should do in order that we can be who we would like to be. Um, and, and so it's a very, very interesting, uh, uh, very, very difficult area to cover in just such a tiny space of time. On our coach training programs, we, we have an entire module that is dedicated to how to set uh, what we call well-formed goals. All right. So we're just trying to give you a little snapshot of that. I'd like to start now. I, I, Sam, I don't know if you can run this poll for me, um, but I'd, I'd love to start with a poll. Um, maybe I can do it, actually. Uh, if you can input, yeah, it's running. Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. It's okay. If you can input um, the answer to this question in the uh, in in the poll, um, which position, which description best describes you? Are you a trainer who's interested in, in in coaching? Are you a coach with some training? Are you interested in becoming a coach, um, or, or any of those other things down there? So, can can you all see the poll window, Sam? Is it visible? It's visible on my side, but not sure. Um, no one has voted yet. So this should appear on your window, on your screens. Otherwise I can, uh, we can launch it again. Hold on. So relaunch. Yeah, I don't want to get, last week this okay. did not work. <laughs> Someone so. said, yes, I can see it. So uh, yeah. this is Joseph. So please input something there. I can't see any, anything coming in, so. Uh... Sam, if you can, maybe you can close it at an appropriate time and uh, 
and let's share the results. Okay. Let's give them a few moments. Working, they said they voted. Um, hold on, let's see. Share results. It it's, <laughs> appears as zero from my side, but, mm. uh, but probably there's a technical issue right now with the polling function. And yeah, the yeah. So, so Zoom clearly haven't yet fixed that. So we're going to move straight along from that. If you wish, uh, um, you can type uh, into, your, into the, into the uh, chat window uh, um, uh, what category you fall into there. Um, and what is your interest in this particular program? But in anyone, let's get let's get into it. Why? So why is it that we um, do what we do, and why is it that we sometimes don't do um, what we uh, should do in order to be who we would like to be? Um, and around that, you know, how, how do we actually stay with our true goals, the things that we really care about, you know, in, in uh, key moments of choice? And what we mean by a moment of choice is any moment where we have an opportunity to either a move towards something that we care about move towards a goal um, and if we don't pay conscious attention at that moment to the goal and to that which we need to do in order to move on that goal um, then it is very very likely um, especially in the busy world in which we live it's likely that we're going to do something different right so how do we stay with um, the things that are important to us moment by moment including when maybe we're being attracted by other things so that's what that about so um if you saw the video that sort of introduced this you, you'll notice that i made a bold statement in that video and that statement is this that we do what we do not necessarily because of language so i'm sure many of you have had the experience of writing to-do lists um, and maybe um, many of you also know that you don't necessarily attend to something just because you wrote it on a to-do list and it might stay stuck on your on your computer screen um, uh, for weeks on end. Maybe a few of you might know some people that have got stuff stuck on their computer and it's been there for a long time. Um, so the problem with it is that even though we may read um, that we need to do something on our list, on a to-do list, which could also be um, you know, you know, a computer-generated to-do list these days, um, we may um, have we may be able to read that there's something to do but unless we at the point of reading it can also bring back the kind of why you know how it felt when we wrote that item on the list we may have we may have really known when we wrote that item what it was that was behind the reason why we wrote it there in the first place but if we can't bring that back into the moment of choice then um, we we are likely to do something else instead so this is a very very interesting phenomenon um so in that moment of choice uh, we may have something that is kind of an important goal that we need to progress but we might simply forget to remember it so i quite like this kind of phrase forgetting to remember even though it sounds like a tautology so i might just simply forget or we might remember but um consciously make a decision not to do it but to actually progress something ls i meant something else not something ls so in other words, we are consciously distracted by what we call shiny objects, which are other things that appear in the moment to be more important than that very important goal that was extremely um, emotionally charged um, at the point that we set it. Right? Um, or it might be that we just simply don't want to do the next step. We, we have some kind of aversion to the next uh, step on the path. So what, what's that about? Why, why, why does this actually happen? So maybe it's worth just sort of then going back and seeing what's really going on moment by moment with us. Why do we do what we do uh, moment by moment? So in, you know, I, I would argue that in every moment we are dealing with stimuli. So there are things coming into our attention through the six fields of our sensory experience. So obviously the stuff coming in through the eyes, through the ears, through the nose, through the mouth, and through the tactile sense, and they're bombarding our attention, screaming for attention, coming in all the time. And then of course, we've got this sixth domain of our experience, which is the mental sense, which is fundamentally thoughts that are arising into the sense organ that detects thoughts, which is the mind. So the mind is the sixth sensory organ, and its object is thoughts you know, that come up. And these are all stimuli that are coming into us all the time. And so what the brain um, does with that is it takes these stimuli in and it immediately connects them 
with a set of what we call implicit memories. So implicit memories are memories that we don't know that we have. They've been, we've been accumulating them through our experience since we were born, right? So it's like a big, big, huge database of everything that has ever happened to us. And in particular, things that have ever happened to us that have caused us some kind of emotional charge, maybe a surge of unhappiness or, or anxiety or fear or anger, um, or, or maybe even extreme happiness. So the stimulus comes in, it is connected to um, memories and, and the brain is looking to make meaning. So the thing at the bottom there is the meaning making or salience network then turns on trying to make sense of this stimulus that is coming in, this event that is coming into our uh, sensory experience. And the way that that works is what it's doing is it's taking the data in from the present moment. And it is using that data to predict how I'm going to feel in the future as a result of that which is happening in this moment. Right? It's making this continuous prediction of how um, I'm going to feel in the future relative to what is happening now. Um, and of course, the data that it is using to make that prediction, the reference point is all of the things that have happened to us in our past, most of which we can't even remember. Right? So, and this is called the meaning making system. So stimulus, in a nutshell, in summary, stimulus plus memories equals our, what we call our experience. It's known as what it feels like to be me in this moment, our subjective experience in this moment. And what that really is, is a bunch of, thought, uh, bunch of feelings that, sh that show up in the body, sensations in the body, which are almost simultaneously arising with thoughts that are coming up in the mind. So the, this combination of feelings and thoughts are um, known as, guess what, emotions. The feel, emotions are feelings in the body which compel thoughts in the mind. And then what they also do is then they, they create impulses to act, right? And, and that impulse to act then leads to a behavior in the moment of choice, right? So this is all going on um, moment by moment beneath our conscious awareness. Most of us are not aware of this process happening, um, but we are aware that moment by moment we are doing something. So the question is, is what we are doing in this moment in service of something that is actually important to us, or is it in service of some prediction that we're making uh, that might threaten our sense of safety in this moment? So this meaning making system that creates thoughts, feelings, emotions, impulses, and then behaviors um, is the mind making decisions for us in a moment about what is important. So the question is, is the mind making a decision accurately? And it has been shown through a lot of research that most of the time, it in fact, is not. The mind for most of us is not in any particular moment pointing at what is actually the most important thing for it to be pointing at in that moment. All right, so there's that. And, and of course, if it is, that's great. That means we may be acting in service of our goals. But if it's, if it's not, if it's been hijacked by something else from our meaning making system, um, then we're gonna go somewhere else and we're just gonna do something that takes us away from our goals. And that sadly is more common for most of us, which is the reason why many of us do not achieve our goals. We don't, uh, uh, um, you know, dreams remain unfulfilled, goals remain unmet, plans, plans uh, get ignored because the mind makes automatic decisions moment by moment about what it ought to be attending to. So what to do? You know, if the mind wants to create our goals for us, <laughs> based on our old patterns and assumptions of what we need in a particular moment to survive and thrive, then how on earth can we hope uh, to stay on track? Right. So to answer this question, I'm gonna to look to Transcend's coaching definition, um, which, which is a lens of which to look at it. So Transcend's coaching definition, you can see at the top, at the top there is the International Coach Federation definition of coaching. But what we've done is we've kind of made that a little bit richer to explain what it is that we are actually doing um, as a coach. And what we're really doing is to really help a client to be crystal clear on what it is that they want, right? In terms of, that's the first part of this. What it, to be clear on their goals um, in the right way. And there's a lot of skill in doing this. And then having done that to help the client to remain present with, I have their mind directed to um, what they need to be attentive to, Right. Um, in order to make optimal moment by moment 
decisions that lead to actions in service of those goals. Sounds simple, um, but it's not necessarily easy uh, for most of us. Now, um, I want to just pause for the moment. Um, Sam, can you just monitor perhaps the, I, I can't see the Q&A box, but this is a good time really just to pause and take any questions that you might have. And by the way, of course, you're most welcome. This is a, this is a, a meeting rather than a webinar. So I'd really be happy if you at any time unmute your mic and say something. That would be lovely if you do that. If you don't want to do that, then just just uh, stick a question in the in the chat window. Anything coming in? I've got seven chats. Let me see. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I'll just carry on then. If you're not, um, if nothing's coming up yet, but do feel free to um, uh, put in your questions whenever you whenever you want to. Okay. Uh, if you feel really bold, you can open up your mic and scream as well. So about staying on track. So how is it that one, how can we help people to stay on track? How can you help yourself to stay on track? And a great way of looking at this is that leveraging the work of, uh, doc, uh, of doctors, uh, Shauna Shapiro and Alan Wallace, um, is, to is to cultivate competence in, in these four mental domains. Um, and, and we call these the uh, mental domains for what well, it says here, exceptional emotional and mental well-being. Um, what it really means is the, to just be able to stay on track, the four mental domains for staying on track. All right. Um, and the first one of those is what we call attentional or focal balance. So attentional balance is simply the ability to focus on what it is that you choose to focus on. Amazingly enough, um, research that was published in, in about 2009, before we had such things as weapons of mass distraction, um, research published in 2009 basically uh, concluded that um, two things actually that were interesting. Firstly, that 50% of the time, the average mind is not focusing on that which is actually optimal uh, for a person's well-being and success. That's the first thing. The second thing is the conclusion was that this, this wandering mind, is, is also an unhappy mind. So if a person allows their mind to wander more often, those people who had more wandering in their minds were also less happy and very much less professionally successful. So very, very interesting series of results. So we talk about attentional balance as, um, as the ability to focus on what you choose. Oh, and secondly, make sure that what you choose is actually the right thing. So that's that. What we're going to be talking about in a few moments is this domain of motivational balance, because this is what goal setting is all about. So motivational balance is kind of the discovery of and knowing of and also the pursuit of um, actions in service of what I really care about. So it's knowing and acting in service of what is really important to me. Again, um, most many of us, I'm not going to say most of us, I don't want to offend anybody. Um, but many of us don't do that um, often enough, just, just acting in service of what we really care about rather than what the mind in one moment is telling us is the most important to us. Uh, okay, um, so um, that's that. Now, this thing called motivational balance gives us a target for our attention. So it's okay having attentional balance, right? Having a calm, clear, serviceable mind, being able to focus at will on whatever is important. But in order to do that, we kind of need to know what it is important, what is important uh, to be an anchor for our attention. And, and this is the domain of uh, motivational balance, knowing what I really care about. The third area, by the way, and we're not going to cover this at all today, but the third area is cognitive balance. And cognitive balance is knowing the, knowing the things that um, are reality as opposed to the ways that the mind is taking us off track. So it's kind of seeing things as they really are rather than simply seeing what the mind is presenting to our awareness. So uh, when we are, um, particularly when emotions are running, it's, uh, emotions create perceptual distortions and we, we no longer see things as they actually are, right? So we see things through uh, the lens of our habitual perceptions. So we're not gonna really touch on that, but that's another big area. And the third area is emotional balance, of course. Emotional balance is really about uh, experiencing emotions fully but not getting caught up in them, but instead uh, being able to utilize skillfully the information that is resident or present within emotions. 
So, so just in this little tiny little summary here, it's the ability to feel emotions and then act skillfully. If we miss, and, and, and there's, two, there's, there's something interesting to know about emotions. We have a choice of either feeling them, and if we don't notice them or feel them, then we will become them. So you have a choice of feeling or being emotions. Can't talk about it, it's a, lot, it's a big topic, um, and, and we don't really have time to go too far into it right now. So about motivational balance. Um, one component of motivational balance is this ability to create what we call a well-formed goal. So here is a well-formed goal. Now I'm gonna stop again for questions because we've got a question. And the question is, how do we help the client to remember the true goal all the time? Great question. Um, and we do this. We well, well, there's many things that we do, um, and of course, we're not, we're not. It's not easy, you know, to keep your goals and the next task and all of the resources you have, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in your mind um, at the same time. But there are things that we can do um, to improve the uh, this. Let, let's let's just say this: that we a, a well-formed goal is a goal which is constructed and articulated. So we used, of course, we use language to articulate the goal, but really um, uh, being able to remember the goal and then act in service of that goal moment by moment when we're being hijacked by all of these stories and cognitions and perceptions, um, being able to do that is an emotional thing. It, 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 we need to feel that moving this way is more important than going that way. And we need to feel it in that moment of choice. So a well-formed goal is a goal that is constructed and then articulated in a way that firstly makes it easy to remember in the moment, i.e. not forget, right? And secondly, once remembered, it, it also in, has the appropriate emotional component. I, you know, it brings up th feelings, thoughts, and impulses which will drive your action um, in that moment of choice and power you past the shiny objects which otherwise might come close and hijack your attention. So that's that's uh, kind of what it is. Um, now, how do we actually do that specifically? So the first, the way that we do it specifically is there are these five components, or sorry, six components. And we say that a well-formed goal is script, script. It is, a well-formed goal is articulated in a way that is specific, that sits within a context and we know what the context is. We understand what resources we have or may need to obtain in order to be able to uh, move on that goal. Very importantly, we understand the impact for us and for others of moving or not moving towards that goal, um, that the goal is expressed in positive terms and that it is actually doable by you. It implicates you. It's not your clever way of getting somebody else to do something. It is something that you yourself are able to do differently and or better in order to achieve outcomes, right? So goals, well, which are well formed, that, that can be achieved, are all about things that you yourself are able to do. You might be leading a team of 5,000 people, but if you want something to happen with all of those people that is different from what is happening right now, it might need to come down to something that you do differently and or better in order that they can be at their best, right? So, um, uh, so for team leaders, uh, uh, this is also quite important. So about about the specificity of the goal. So Joseph, um, you know, just just uh, type a thumbs up or do anything you like in order to signal that we're moving in the right direction for you in terms of getting that question answered. <laughs> um, or you can ask a follow up question if you wish, of course. So let's just quickly touch on specific. Um, and, and this is really simply just making sure that you have chunked this down. Because if you have not articulated your goal specifically, then you are going to have trouble bringing it all back to mind. If it's too complex and too airy-fairy, um, then, then you, you, you won't be able to bring it back to mind in that one moment that you have the opportunity to practice something differently, right? Um, than, than that which you've always done, okay? So, about that so what is it specifically you know that you would like to accomplish and or develop and make it as molecular as you possibly can right um in, and ask yourself questions like you know so what's it going to be like uh, when this happens what's it going to be like around me and and very importantly how am i going to know when i've actually made the movement how am i going to know um when, when this happens right? 
So this is um, about specificity. And the idea is really just to get it so that it, it is easy to make the goal available to the mind in the moment of choice. This is what needs to happen because the mind is being bombarded with stimuli. You know, we live in what we call the paid reality. It's pressure always on information overloaded and distracted reality. So there are no shortage of place. There's no shortage of places for your attention uh, to go. Um, please, uh, at least we can do our best to make sure that our attention goes on things that are important to us where we want it to. So we need to make those things attractive to our attention and easy uh, to make available to the mind. All right. So that's uh, specific. All right. So the next area is is um, uh, uh, context. So there are various different contexts that are relevant here. You know, we, we say tre, T R E S, temporal context, and and this is time. So asking yourself now, a lot of us get into trouble with time when it comes to goals. We want everything to happen now. We get agitated and we 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 dwell on instead of dwelling on goals, we tend to dwell on problems. Things that are happening right now that we don't want. And it just causes frustration, anxiety, or other uh, emotional agitation. And that emotional agitation then hijacks our attention and prevents us from progressing something in this moment that might lead towards something that we care about in a longer term. So, so time is a very, very important part of this. We can have everything that we want as long as we don't want it all now or tomorrow or maybe even next week we need to be realistic and put in a, a plan um, properly uh, knowing that time is actually a resource and if only we can be a bit patient we can have it all all right so there's that um, so that's the time context when do you need this to happen by by the way on that a lovely little uh, tool that you can use uh, for your clients if you're a coach or would like to be or for you is to use what I call the mental time machine, machine approach, which is where you just imagine um, popping yourself into a time machine, pressing the button and maybe winding yourself forward maybe 12 months, and then getting out there and looking at how your life is. You know, How do I want my life to be 12 months from now? And you go out there and you visualize it and you make it rich with a full sensory experience. Who am I with? What am I doing? What am I, you know, you know, what are people saying about me? 12 months from now, not next week, 12 months from now. It's a great little technique. Having done that, <clears throat> what we do is we, we then start looking back and saying, okay, so what's the date today? Today's the 11th of June. And you ask, well, what is it that I started doing on the 11th of June so that I can have all of this now? And this just helps us to realize uh, and, and put some perspective on it, that if we just give ourselves a little bit of time and space, we can develop the competencies, we can build the relationships, we can execute some plans, we can create some goals. And uh, if only um, I, I, I take a longer term view, um, then there's a pretty good chance, you know, that I might be able to, if you wish, get the things that I want to get. So that's uh, the temporal side. Uh, the second one is relational. So uh, with whom? would you like this goal uh, uh, to be? So what are the, what are the, who else is involved with this? So uh, one example of this, um, a lady that I was working with, she was a CEO of, a, of an organization in Shanghai, um, FNCG organization. And she said to me that she wanted to build executive presence. And she, she, so I said, okay, so, in what particular situations? And then she, she told me stories about where she's breaking down, you know, like yeah, she's perfectly okay, but in board meetings or in front of senior people who are, if you wish, important, for some reason it all goes wrong. So this is what we mean by relational contexts. Um, with whom? Emotional is context is maybe um, sometimes for some people, for some goals, they, people um, have emotions that take them off track. They might say, for example, things like, well, you know, um, I, I would like to be respectful um, when I'm angry. I would like to be respectful when I'm personally feeling disrespect. Okay, so that's um, that's uh, one one um, uh, 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 what we call emotional context. And then the final one is what we call really simply just a situational context, which is really where where does this apply? You know, in what environments, what 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 places uh, uh, does it apply in? Okay. 
So, so there you go. So this is a great question from Dariana that's coming here, which speaks to a slightly different area of goal setting, which is what we call values, um, which is part of the well-formed goal process. So I think what I'll do, Dariana, is maybe just, um, um, I think it's a great question, but let's just quickly go through um, this and, and get through the impact piece, and then we'll see if this question is answered or not. Okay. Um, uh, now I'm trying to work out how to advance the slide. Okay, good. So the next, the next point is, is uh, resources, right? So we need to know that either we have the resources or we don't. And if we don't have the resources, that's great. Then we would like to go out and get those resources. Um, Selena's just asked, what is the difference between relational and situational? So situational really means place. It's about what place might this apply. Um, relational is about with whom uh, might this apply, right? And by the way, not all of these context of TRES, they, they may not apply to every goal. Um, but what we what we know about goal setting is people need to to learn to explore areas that they are otherwise missing, otherwise they might um, uh, get derailed by things that pop up that were not expected. So a lot of this is about mentally rehearsing um, what might hijack your attention in the moment of choice. Right. So you may have a certain goal, but then some person comes along and you derail or some other situation arises in you derail. So there's that. So resources, uh, we, we said that resources, in terms of analyzing your resources, whether you have the resources or can remember your resources in the moment of choice, um, we look at four domains um, where, where um, the, um, the, 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 there's a line. Um, so these top two boxes um, on this uh, diagram are about stuff about you, just only you. And the bottom two boxes are about stuff, um, which is, uh, if you wish, in the group or collective domain. So it might be about the organization or it might be about um, uh, other groups in which you exist. Okay. So that's the individual versus collective domain. And then we also then have this other dimension, which is the internal dimension, which is really stuff that is known only to you or experienced only by you on the one on the left hand side, two boxes here. And then there's on the other side, uh, two boxes are, are stuff that is kind of known to, to everybody inside that, uh, that system. All right. So this is a very good way to inquire of yourself or if you're a coach of your clients um, about whether they are considering everyone and everything in the context of what they might need to remember in the moment of choice in order to move towards a goal. So individual internal, it's really it's stuff that you know about yourself that others may not know unless you tell them or unless you behave in a certain way. So this is all your values, your beliefs, your preferences, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, um, the way that you have internalized the expectations of other people. So all of this is in the internal individual domain. And some of that stuff may interfere with you in the context of movement towards your goals and others of it um, may support you. Right. So we need to know that. OK. Um, so then on the outside um, of the individual, you've got um, the external dimension of the individual. And this is really all about if, things like appearance, um, um, but more particularly your skills, your strengths, uh, your knowledge, your experience and your um, abilities. But of course, it also may relate to your experience. You know, if you're working at Goldman Sachs and you turn up with green hair, that might get in the way of, uh, of many of your goals, your professional goals, for example. Of course, if you're working in an art company and you turn up with green hair, that might be um, a way to actually get some of what you want from a, uh, from your professional goals. So, so this is what that is. And you need to know these things. And we say that you should that, that a person or their coach should do what we call an integral exploration of their resources. You know, all of these things are either resources or potential interference to a person um, as they're contemplating moving forward towards their goal. Right? Um, and we need to rehearse all of this so that we make the resources available to our mind in the very moment that we need to use them. Otherwise, you know what? They're going to go missing in action in the moment. We're going to do something else if we can't remember it easily. Right? Um, so the next area is just dropping down to the bottom right hand side here is what we call the external collective. So if it, the company is the most common collective really that we talk about here. And this is the kind of systems area. Um, your, your organizational charts, your um, training departments, your 
systems, processes, controls, constraints, or other organizational support structures that you might be forgetting that, are, that might be available to you um, to help you to move towards your goals, or sometimes perhaps may interfere with you um, as you contemplate moving towards your goals. And of course, if they interfere, then no, no need to get anxious about it. It's just a phenomenon. But there are other goals to set around how to make the best of that how to make the best of what you consider to be a bad situation. It's just another process, just another set of goals. And we always need to keep our mind on the prize rather than on the problem. Keep our mind on what we want rather than what we don't want. Okay. And then bottom right, the internal, a lot of people question this, why is relationships in the internal domain? Well, the reason why relationships is generally, generally thought to be in the internal domain is because how a person experiences somebody else is purely their stuff, it's internal stuff. Somebody might love me, another person might hate me for the same reason, right? So it's very, very um, internal. So um, how, who else can we enroll um, in helping us to move towards the things that we would love to uh, move towards? What requests might we make to others? What promises might we need to deliver in return? You know, um, how can we enlist and enroll others? Or how can we um, know um, what interference we might get from either relationships or politics or culture? And that's what this stuff is all about. Okay. Um, yeah, so a question has come up from, from Annie and the answer is no. Um, there's no need to go through this in any order at all. In fact, it's quite useful to dance between different questions around these different quadrants. Um, so, so no, but what we need to do uh, as coaches, yeah, yeah, good. So chat has mentioned that this is drawn from, it is in fact adapted from integral theory. Absolutely, so well done for noticing that. That's Ken Wilber's work, inter alia. So um, um, yeah, so um, what most people do is they over index one or another area. Um, uh, uh, so if you ask people what they need to do, so if you ask low performing people particularly, why it is that they are not performing well. They'll often deal with the stuff in the bottom two quadrants. It is everybody else's and everything else's fault that I am not doing well. Even though there may be another person in the next office who has exactly the same um, collective uh, organization around them um, that is doing perfectly well, <laughs> right? So um, Poor, low, lower potential people are often blame uh, the stuff down there. High potential people, when asked why they're not doing well, they talk about their mindsets, their mental states, their beliefs, the things that they might need to reframe. They talk about their own behaviors, their own strengths, their own abilities that they might need to go out and acquire. So it's a very, very interesting thing. What we need to do, wherever a person is, we need to help them to see the whole picture. As Ken Wilber calls it, Ken Wilber himself uses the language AQAL, all quadrants, all levels. And what he really means by that is everyone and everything that may be impacted on this goal needs to be considered while the goal is being formed. If we don't consider it while the goal is being formed, we're going to get high. Our attention is just going to go somewhere. It's just going to be too difficult in the moment of choice to make the decision to make progress towards the goal. Yeah, so it's a great question. And thanks for asking it. So this is a, a very, very important area and that's impact. So I think this may begin to speak to um, um, Dariana's uh, question um, together with the uh, stuff under um, the integral resources there. And, um, and really what this is, 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 and this is, you know, I would actually argue that this is arguably the most important domain of all. Um, we must never miss impact for ourselves if we're just trying to set goals for ourselves or, or for others. And these are the kinds of questions we might need to ask ourselves. So obviously, you know, what do we get by moving on this goal, by moving in this direction or, or, or building this competency? Uh, uh, what do we get from that? You know, um, and what might we lose from doing that? What might we lose from not doing that? You know, what is the trajectory of our existing behavior? Where might it lead us? And what might be the trajectory of changing our behavior in this way? Where might that lead us? And remember, over time, not tomorrow. If you have been abusive to somebody for four years and you just are kind to them in one day, it's going to take some time 
um, for their hostility perhaps to soften. But there's one thing I can promise you is it will change everything if you show up differently with people with whom you have a difficult relationship. It just does. So this, I've, I'm dwelling on this third question here because it's so important. Is it worth, so this question is, is like this, is it worth what it's going to take to make the change? Behavioral change is not easy. So it normally involves things and, and, and these things that need to be let go of are often what we call hidden drivers. Like for example, the hidden driver that I might have uh, in, in a particular moment to always get my ideas listened to, or to never be seen to being vulnerable, or to never be blamed for anything, or perhaps all, to always be liked by everybody moment by moment. So hidden drivers are around intolerance to things that make us feel unsafe in a moment. So we need to let those go because those are like the elastic bands that are holding us back and preventing us from moving forward. We need to notice those hidden drivers running us in a particular moment and let go of them and put our attention on what we want um, so that we can move forward. So this is a question for everybody that is setting goals. Um, is it worth what it's going to take to make this change? Because it's going to, it could be feel, feel very, very uncomfortable for a while um, while we're practicing the new behaviors. We're having to notice the storylines running that are driving the existing behavior. And in that same moment, we're going to need to let go of those storylines and trust that those stories, uh, which are actually trying to protect us from emotional pain, um, they're protecting us from something that is not dangerous. They're in fact protecting us from something that is less dangerous than the consequence of holding on to that story and not changing. Right? So we need to not only know that now while you're setting the goal, you need to know it in a way that comes back into your mind in the very moment when you're just about to roll your eyes at somebody or interrupt somebody or perhaps the opposite, withdraw uh, from speaking up when you need to speak up or whatever it might be that is your goal, if that makes sense. Um, others, you know, this is a very important point, you know, what, what might others get or not get? Um, as you move towards this, it might be uncomfortable for other people as you change, or it might be very, very great for other people as you change. And it's good to know that. Um, what else might happen and what won't happen? You know? <laughs> um, and, then, uh, and then really repeating the whole thing um, with the opposite. So assuming that I do not make any change, okay, um, what is gonna happen um, for me um, and also for others? You know, if we have a change that we would like to work on, a positive developmental or behavioral change, then we need to contemplate that if we don't make that change, then bad things might happen. You know, we, we, we really need to focus on the benefits of making the change and the negative consequences of not uh, making, making the change. All right, so that's part of it. And in what other ways is this meaningful for you? Very, very important. And if there's no energy, as you said, if you're setting a goal and you're not really excited by it, you won't do it. All right. So you've got to find uh, alternative stories that you can install into your neural operating system that mean that when you attend to making the movement on this goal, um, uh, then you move. By the way, there's one on here that, that I forgot to mention, and it really should be in here, is... Um, uh, and it certainly is, you know, on, on, the, on our longer programs, we do a lot of work on values. And there's a lot of uh, a misunderstanding about what values are. Values are always about your own voices. They're not the voices of your culture. They're not the voices of other people's expectations of you. What we need to do in order to create sustainable, stress-free change for people is to help them to find their own values. The, uh, the voices um, which, are, which are theirs. And, and they can be, can be quite difficult uh, uh, to discover. But the one thing I will say is that, is that for everybody um, inside, underneath all of the stories of expectations that have been installed by others um, in there um, is your true north. It is under it all. Um, and your job is to see if you can discover that. And then when you discover it, if it's sensible, follow it follow it. And so that might help to, to deal with uh, Dan Dariana's question. Goals are much, much more powerful if they're not driven by pliance, 
where pliance means the expectations that really it's about social expectations. Of course, it's related to compliance, um, but pliance is, is, is really about the expectations of others rather than your, the expectations that you set for yourself. Yeah, so there's that. Um, I'm just reading a question here. Um, Yeah, yeah, well, I'm sorry, you, you're, now you're talking about the, ah, I see you're talking about the well-formed goal now. Yeah, yeah, as to um, the first question, yeah, it's very true. The first question, if we're setting goals with people, we'll ask them the simple question, what is it that they would like to happen? Um, and the first thing that we normally do, is, so, so I thought you were talking about the integral uh, model, uh, Annie. Um, but yeah, around the well-formed goal, the first thing we would do is basically see if we can get a handle on what it is that a person would like to accomplish and to move it into what we call tentative goal territory. Because if not, quite often, if I ask you uh, a person what they would like to accomplish, um, in about 80% of the time, they don't come to me with a goal, they come with a problem. You know, oh, my boss is this, this, that, or the other, and they talk about everything that's happening that they don't want. Or they might even talk about an outcome. So an outcome is, well, you know, I want my team to respect me for, so that's an, uh, an, uh, an outcome of certain behaviors um, or or it might be a remedy you know um, I'd like my headache to go away I'd like my boss to go away um, um, which is a remedy to a problem but they often don't come in with something which is really a goal that can be worked on in coaching so the first step is to kind of move out from so if a person comes with a problem you might say okay so you've got this problem okay thank you for sharing that and what is it that you want to happen I understand what you don't want. What is it that you do want? And, and get people uh, uh, to focus on something that they want, which then puts them in a much more resourceful state. It's known as an approach state. And, and an approach state, which is where people are focusing on goals and outcomes, is a much more um, a resourceful state for people to be in. Um, so the first step is we really just get to need to, and if somebody comes with an outcome, which is like, um, well, you know, I want my team to bill 15 million US dollars more than they're billing right now. Then my question would be, okay, lovely. Thank you for sharing that. And what is it that you can do differently so that that might happen? I know what you, because otherwise it's not going to happen. You know, if you're the leader of this team, then, and you're in for coaching, then, then it's down to you to work out what can you do to influence the outcomes that you're looking for. Um, a classic one that I often view is my team don't listen to me and I want them to listen to me. Okay, great. So what is it that you might do differently so that that might happen? And then you start moving all of this, you know, problem oriented thinking, remedy oriented thinking, outcome oriented thinking, nothing wrong with outcomes, of course, but at the end of the day, we still need to move it into something that implicates you and is true for you, right? something that you can do. Um, and once you've got that, the next questions are all about meaning. So you're right uh, in that regard. The next questions after that. So this is not in any particular order. It's in the order that makes the acronym sound good, SCRIP, but not necessarily in the order that you might attack the problem. And by the way, the order that you will use very much depends upon your client or, or on you, but you've got to cover them all. That's the, the thing to know, all right? So again, I'm not sure if that's a little bit more helpful maybe than the, the original answer. <laughs> okay. so the important there thank you so the important thing is um you know you need to feel it you need to feel that this goal is worthy and and normally when you when you've got a well-formed goal there will be an emotional charge that uh, comes with that goal and if there isn't one um you're probably not going to do it because you're so busy with with all kinds of things your attention will just get hijacked into something else that appears to be important in the moment there'll be a charge with that that supersedes um the charge uh, uh, that you feel when you um, uh, think about the goal. Next one is is really we, we, we like goals to be positively stated. And, and again, as, as I mentioned just earlier on, um, focusing on something positive. So instead of saying, I want to stop interrupting people as a goal, because even as I say that, I'm tensing up, I'm not in a resourceful state. Um, so instead of saying, uh, setting a goal, I want to stop interrupting people, we can say, you know what? Um, what I would like to do is I'd love to be patient and kind and allow other people to fully express themselves so that um, um, I can be I can uh, have more influence over them and or be a better leader, you know, or, or what it is. 
So a well-formed goal is often expressed quite succinctly as kind of two paragraphs. I would like to be able to do this so that I can have that. And that's kind of like the summary of quite a long kind of process of discovery, which includes a discovery of value sometimes. And, it, and it's very, very important because once you've got your goal well formed, everything else happens automatically. But why? Because moment by moment, you're likely to remember it because uh, from a neurological point of view, a well-formed goal activates the dopaminergic reward system. So when we contemplate the goal, we have a sense of reward. And dopamine, as you may know, is the gateway to our awareness. When dopamine levels are high, attention remains fixed on whatever it is that we're thinking about. And so we remain attentive to the goal, even if part of achieving that goal means we have to do some things that we may not like to do. Very important that we do this correctly, get it to get that emotional feeling of reward. And remembering that, that acting in service of our goals has its own reward, even if we don't get what we want. This is not about getting what you want necessarily. It's about being at your best moment by moment. Of course, that makes it much more likely that you're going to get what you want. But the goal is really to bring your best into all of the situations that relate to this goal. So maybe may including things like uh, if you have a goal um, to be a better listener and to be kind, you need to notice when you're feeling disrespected and you're just about to go into combat. And notice the opportunity to practice being at your best in that moment, which might mean saying something like, you know, what you said was quite hurtful, John. Um, can I ask what your intention was there? And really just, just sharing what is true. Um, and you find other people's hostility just evaporates when you do that. All right, so finally on the uh, well-formed goal um, is, is this business of, uh, oh, uh, I don't need to share the coaching definition again. Um, but finally, um, um, it's about, oh, it's missing. All right, I've got the wrong slide. So what I wanted is a slide which had the word, just the word possible. The goal needs to be something that you can do. So this is really what possible means. Uh, many, many things are possible, but many people set goals which are actually about things that they want other people to do. No problem. That is potentially an outcome that others might be more um, influenced by uh, the things that I would love to have happen. But we always need to focus on what is it that we can do in order that that uh, might happen. Right? And, but, and by the way, please remember that when we state our goals positively, um, we often go into quite a nice place. When we progress even micro steps towards goals, a sense of well-being arises. And a sense of well-being is now known to be a precondition for professional success. There is a lot of research over the last 15 years that well-being precedes, precedes success rather than success creating well-being. In fact, there is a lot of contrary evidence about the relationship between professional success and well-being. Um, above a certain level, that is an inverse relationship, sadly. So we really need to know how to, to keep ourselves on track. Right? All right. So I, I won't show you this. Oh, okay. So just, <laughs> I will show you. This is not the definition. Um, so in simple terms, we say that a coach helps a client to do what they need to do so that they can be who they would love to be. We say um, that may be true, but there's also another level to it, which kind of turns it on our head. Um, in terms of what a well-formed goal really helps people to do. And it's very profound and very simple. Um, uh, a well-formed goal, which is really the domain of, 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 um, of behavioral change, which is otherwise known as transformational change. Um, uh, a behavioral change coach or a transformational coach will help a client to be who they need to be um, so that they can do uh, what they need to do. And it kind of needs to be looked at kind of that way around in, in a way, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stop. I'm going to leave the coaching definition up just for the moment. Um, but I'm going to pause. And in a minute, I'm going to let Sam speak. But before I do that, um, I'm going to just ask you if there are any questions. I know this was, I mean, didn't quite, I thought if I get you into breakout rooms and get you to do things, um, there'll, be, there'll be no time really to deliver what, what, what hopefully is some useful and important content for you. Um, so, um, has anybody got any questions? Anybody want to say anything? It'd be lovely to hear from someone. An actual human voice would be great. Anyone want to say anything? 
ask anything. Maybe I can ask a question. It's an internal Please. question from Transcend. Um, ah. you know, just because uh, I observe a lot of people here are uh, coaches and um, also have done our coach trainings. But what about from an organizational side? How can, let's say, a leader or a, a people manager, a team manager, make use of this in their work organizationally? I, I, I mean, you know, as you, you know, I think uh, you, you probably know my point of view on that, that Sam. It sounds like it might be a slightly leading question, so thank you for it. <laughs> um, every single, every person in leadership needs to learn this stuff because the, the, a leader's job, um, um, especially in the VUCA reality in which we live today, this volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world um, where change is the only constant. We need, um, as leaders, uh, to be adaptive to what is happening moment by moment. And almost every moment um, has a sense of profound overwhelm in it. Right? So we need to be adaptive, which fundamentally means that we, we, um, we, are, we normally, uh, we, we normally um, uh, when stuff comes to us, we normally, most of, most of the time, like 99% of the time, we react to things that come to us without um, a moment of conscious choice. So this process um, really is about helping a leader to be at their best moment by moment, right? So the, leaders, the, the, leader, the leader has many, many jobs, but one job that is, is, is often forgotten is possibly the most important one, because we of course assume that leaders have skills, they have subject matter experience, they have leadership skills, um, but they forget that a big part of their job is about being at their best moment by moment, despite um, difficult situations. We're in the middle of a lot of difficult situations right now. And we need to find the resources within us to be at our best in those moments. And I said, despite those moments, I actually mean, especially in those moments, this is where a leader has a chance to step up and differentiate themselves from people in the next building, in the next company. So about a leader being at their best, what does that really look like? And I'm just gonna sum it up in one paragraph. A leader at their best is acting and behaving in a way, moment by moment, that is on an ongoing basis, bringing everybody around them to be at their best too. Very important part of a leader's job to be at their best and as part of that, um, behaving in a way um, that creates psychological safety so that everybody can be at their best. And that's got nothing to do with tolerating um, unethical, dishonesty, poor performance, or all of those things that need to be dealt with. Um, it's an act of kindness, uh, to the individual um, that is not performing, um, that, 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 that a conversation that they may not wish to hear is actually delivered to them by a leader um, who is acting with wise compassion. Um, even though you may not want to, um, um, they're able to, to provide a difficult message um, in service uh, of the longer term benefit, not just for them, um, but also for the individual and also for the company at large. So a great leader will always be taking a long-term, wider perspective around what being at their best actually means. So does that answer that question, do you think, uh, Sam? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And, and of course, you know, well-formed goal is a much more complex process than what we've been able to set here. Um, and uh, for leaders, um, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of this uh, in the context of leadership is about values, values. Um, and, um, and discovering what values are that can actually lead them to being at their best moment by moment. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Dariana about the thought that an end goal should be challenging. This is a very interesting question, okay. Um, goals should have an element of stretch, you know, otherwise they're not gonna create enough um, flow in the moment. So, that, so of course, um, there, 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 I, I couldn't bring this in, but there are five criteria that we we need to look at uh, when we sum up on well-formed goals. Um, number four of those is whether there is an adequate stretch. So of course, you know, we, we shouldn't forget the basics here. You know, we want people in the learning zone. We don't, want them, we don't want them in the panic zone. We want them to be in what's known as a state of eustress. So eustress is stress, which is accompanied with a positive emotional experience, which is not the same as distress, which is where we're out there in the panic zone, where we've got a demand that has come to us um, in an area that we have appraised to be impactful to us, 
and we don't believe that we have the resources or we can't get the resources in order to meet that demand. That will be distressing. And distress is just simply whatever anybody tells you. Um, uh, and some companies try to manage distress versus eustress, and it doesn't work well. Distress is just not useful. Um, distress moves us into a self-protective mode and we lose access to our creative collaborative resources uh, and we can't be at our best because we're in a threat state so we want to be in a position of eustress which is like what we call a manageable threat that there's there is um, a demand there but we believe that we may have the resources or we can find the resources to meet that demand um, and um, um, and the area and the impact is high <laughs> Share other points except for just point four. Okay, I will. I'll do it. So it's very simple. Okay. It's a quick check-in on, on your goal. Number one, is this goal true for you? So true for you meaning means it is your goal. It's not just only something that somebody else wants you to do. So 360 degree feedback is great as long as the individual internalizes it. And then it becomes not just something that it that, that the company wants but they've internalized it so it has now become something that they realize themselves that they need uh, to change. Okay, so that's the first thing. Is it true for you? If it's just something that somebody else wants of, wants of you, it's unlikely to be done um, in the moment of choice, right? So there's that. Second, um, does it implicate you? So does it implicate you means, um, uh, is this your goal or is it a clever way for you to get someone else to do something? So things like someone actually put me on mute there. Was that on purpose? Sam, did you do that? I just put uh, yeah, unintentionally. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought maybe you were telling me to shut up. It's okay. Um, uh, <laughs> so the second one is, 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 does it implicate you, which is, you know, um, uh, is it is it your goal? So the, the example I was giving was, you know, some people come in and they say that my goal is to have people respect respect me more. Well, that's actually about somebody else rather than about you. So does the goal implicate you? Is it something that you are actually able uh, to influence through your actions? Right? Um, the third one is um, uh, is it uh, is it important to you? And again, so we normally ask a simple scaling question, you know. Um, on a scale of not to 10, you know, how important is this? And if the answer is below eight, then there might be a little bit more work to do. Because remember, we're dealing with behavioral change goals. When people are generally under a, a, a level of stress and the more stress we're under, the more difficult it is to actually uh, um, create different thoughts, feelings and impulses and behaviors. Uh, we tend under stress to just default back to our habitual perceptions and patterns and actions. Right? So, so that's that. Um, the fourth one is, um, is, it, uh, uh, is it a stretch? I, I mentioned that, uh, is there that stretch um, uh, where uh, you're in the learning zone? In other words, you should not be giving yourself an A already at this thing, right? Um, uh, so there's that. And then the fifth one is simply, is it positive? Is it, is it actually a goal or a problem, a remedy or an outcome, right? Um, is it positively stated? So that's the other four. I think I better stop, otherwise I'm going to get uh, kicked off by Sam. Sam, would you like to say something? <coughs> uh, yes, sure, of course. Um, yeah, I'll, wind, I'll uh, go on. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you guys for staying um, with us so far. And uh, we'd love to talk to you um, with regards to any questions that you may have, any follow-up that you may have. Um, a lot of you are familiar with this already and know that we're very approachable. Um, so for those who are, uh, you know, this is the first time being exposed to Transcend and Transcend's work, please do contact us. We have an email here, partnerships at Transcend International. Um, but also we want to let you know about the um, three different, let's say, categories in which we do our work. Um, one is we do professional and executive coaching for individuals, but also groups and teams. Um, we also do um, coach trainings, uh, coach accreditation trainings. Um, and we also take a lot of this content and customize it and provide the trainings in an organizational or corporate setting. So um, with regards to these three or anything else, if you have any questions, 
please let us know and contact us. Um, let us know as well that you attended this webinar. We'd love to um, honor that um, and, and figure out something of mutual benefit for both of us. Um, so yeah, let's speak. Thank you so and stay much. Stay tuned for the next webinar. Sam, what's the next webinar? I think it's on well-formed values, right? It, the next webinar is on stuck. So oh, being stuck. Okay. On, um, you know, uh, what does that mean? A lot of clients and a lot of teams feel stuck um, in achieving their goals. And it's for us to flesh it out in the next webinar, which is in a week or two, but uh, you'll receive communication about that. Do follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter as well. Thank you guys. So thank you very much. And thanks for the lovely feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Bye now. Bye. 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 Bye.